Hey, I'm journalist Joe Lauder. As a fan of conversations, you must love a good story. And have I got a cracker for you? I'm the host of the new ABC podcast called Saving the Franklin. In this season of Dig, I'm bringing you a story of enchanting wilderness, savage politics, and violent confrontations as I go back to the Franklin River blockade to find out, in a fight for the environment, what does it take to win? It's a lot of anticipation right now. Baby's first trip to the Franklin. (laughs) Australia's biggest ever environmental battle was over this remote stretch of river in Tasmania. People flew in from all over Australia simply to be arrested. If that dam is built, all this this forest here would be lost forever. Should the Franklin River be dammed or not? The Franklin River is nothing but a brown, leech-ridden ditch. My job is now on the line and my husband's is on the line. This fight captured and divided the whole country. We escalated and it split families. The Hydroelectric Commission's headquarters has now been firebombed. There's been a threat that you'll be assassinated. 40 years on, I decided it's time to revisit Australia's biggest ever environmental campaign. If enough people care, we can win. I want to know, in a fight for the environment, what does it take to win? Like all mythology, it depends on who's telling the story. This is Saving the Franklin. Find it on the ABC Listen app. ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. For 13 years, Paul Kennedy set his alarm very early so he could turn up on time for his gig as sports presenter on ABC News Breakfast. This year, Paul shifted into a new role as a senior sports reporter across all the ABC and he's also released a memoir called Funky Town. It tells the story of Paul's life in the year 1993 when he was 17 and in his last year of high school in Seaford, Victoria, and with dreams of making it big at the MCG. Hi, Paul. Hi, Sarah. Why Funky Town? I need to ask that question right off the bat. Why (laughs) is it called Funky Town? Uh, Funky Town was the nickname that my little sister had for Frankston. So I lived in Seaford, but Seaford is right next to Frankston and and there was a shopping mall, American style shopping mall, and uh, we had, you know, that had a Maya and we had uh, we had some cinemas, so that was good. And we had a double story Maccas where they had the golden railing down the down the <laughs> middle so you could slide down the railing when you're all full up with uh, McDonald's. And uh, it had everything else. It's um it was a great place to live. It's right on the bay. It's such a beautiful place if you go there, but um, it's also like other outer suburbs, outer outer suburban regions. You know, it's got its disadvantages as well, you know, but people who live there take that in their stride and and we tend to love the place anyway. And in your place, Paul, in in Seaford, who lived at home Mm. with you? Who was in your family house in 1993? Uh, Mum and dad and my brother, my older brother Steve, and older sister Jo, and a younger sister Kate. We were all born pretty close. Um, when we were babies, mum had f- four of us under five. Now, we moved into that estate in 1977, and it was a brand new estate. Dad had just left the army. I was born in uh, Seymour Hospital, and we lived in Parker Punyal when I was uh, for the first two years of my life because dad was in the army. And when he left the army, he got to choose from a couple of different places in Melbourne, you know, these new estates, and uh, he'd get a good bank deal on a, on a loan. That's how it worked if you left the army. So he and mum decided to go to Seaford. We were the, one of the first houses in the street, and it was, you know, I just remember uh, a lot of mud because everything had been cleared, the bright blackest roads. Uh, <laughs> the bitumen was always new and sort of melted a little bit in summer. And and uh, I just remember all of these houses going up one by one and it was the best playground you could ever have in a new <laughs> suburb. The, the frames of houses would go up and we'd treat them like monkey bars and just everything was new in the place and everyone was young and, and I thought that was paradise and I, looking back, I still do. Who built the house that you grew up in? My uncle built the house, my uncle Gary, who was a builder, and he built it with my dad. So dad doesn't have an official trade, but he's he's uh, the best with tools that I've ever seen. 
uh, and G- Gary was an outstanding builder. So they got to work uh, building the house and that was my first first memory or first experience of seeing men at work. So that was that was my first working role models. What do you remember about how they how they were with one another? They, they were. I thought it was normal, but I mean, that's um, they were exceptional. Really, uh, they would get about their work and take only a few minutes if they needed to stop for lunch. Uh, they used to climb the walls and have a laugh, and they just were in such such a good mood all the time. Uh, they never swore because you know there might be women around. Uh, I never heard them talking like I grew up to hear other men talk. They were just fantastic. They loved each other's company and, um, you know, I remember one time we had to um, uh, go down to the milk bar to get the, get the hungry workers a drink and brought back a couple of cans and one was a can of Solo and and Gary was so full on and wanted to get back into work, he sculled this can of Solo in one and I couldn't believe it. It's one just of those like things when you're a kid, just like the ad, slam it down fast, no, load on the fizz. So he... I, and I couldn't believe it. I thought, wow, I can't can't wait to grow up to do that. You know, how could he possibly do that? He, you know, he stomped on the can and uh, handed it back to me and, and uh, back to work they went with their tool belts on. So, Tell me a little bit more about your dad, Paul. What did he look like when you were a kid? What, what image do you have in your mind of him? <laughs> dad was uh, dad was my Superman. He was he was a big, strong man and mighty forearms. He had a couple of tattoos on his forearms, which and and he was a gentleman too. I have to say that, but uh, the, the little tattoos on his forearms, which he did himself while he was in the navy with a couple of mates, sort of go, always gave me the indication that um, you know Dad had had his had his wilder past when he was a young bloke. He, he drove a truck for a living, so he was sometimes on the road longer than he wanted to be. Just around town, he wasn't an interstate truckie. And so mum had to do some heavy lifting with me and, and my schooling. But, um, but yeah, dad was always there and uh, you know, a quiet man who, who one day built an aviary in the backyard because he loved birds. <laughs> but if you looked at him, and I've, I've seen, I saw other men look at him over the years and, and I've heard other men say, you know, your, your dad looks, looks imposing or he looks tough. And, and I suspect he is, but he's more of a gentleman. What about your mum? What were what were some of the more interesting jobs she had when you were growing up? Oh, mum had had a few jobs. I mean, she was at home with us when we were all babies, under five, and um, and then she had some some part time jobs. The best one was she worked at the local Roller City Rink in Seaford, and uh, oh, that was a hell of a good place. She, <laughs> she was the manager. I think she might have you know cleaned the toilets and did the payrolls and did everything, but. My oldest sister was was old enough at this stage to do a little bit of work, a bit of part time work. So she got to serve um, serve the soft drinks behind the counter. Me and my brother and my little sister we used to um, stack the skates, those dirty, filthy brown skates, uh, which people would return and we'd put them up into the rack. And if they were really disgusting, we'd put some white powder in them. You know, I still don't know what the white powder is. You know, I assumed it was toxic. But at the end of our shift, uh, Mum used to give us the the keys to go and open the uh, the pinball machines. Open up the penny machines, get out all the 20 cent coins and then feed them back and, and play the pennies. We felt like we were, we felt like royalty there, you know. <laughs> Your, mum, mum was the, the queen of the roller city rink and, <laughs> and we were princes and princesses and, and on top of that we got the skate. I, I, I loved um, I loved skating and I thought I was pretty good and I look back I was about seven and uh, you know <laughs> probably barely barely holding my feet but um, great times in the roller city rink and then and then mum she went back to school and she she left at school left school when she was fifteen when she went back to school to study social work she just loved it and uh, you know one of the greatest photos we've got is is mum receiving her diploma and wearing her gown and then she went in and spent the next 25 years looking after kids and placing them in into homes uh, in the foster care part of that uh, social working so and and she was so dedicated your mum was uh, pretty good with her hairdressing scissors too <laughs> yeah we used to get our hairs cut our hair cut by mum um, we thought that was normal I guess probably was at the time you know, she learned how to do it in the in the women's weekly so I, I don't I don't think uh, anyone would um, hold it against me if I was slightly critical. She, her skills were limited. Um, and when I went and watched Top Gun with my mates at the Frankston Cinema, 
I just I just wanted to be Tom Cruise, so I came back and said, um, can I have a Tom Cruise haircut? And uh, Maverick, the character Maverick in Top Gun, and, and all Mum did was basically just cut the, cut the fringe off because I had a short back and sides anyway, which is my, you know, standard. So uh, she cut my fringe off. My sister Jo, who's, who's a straight shooter and uh, my, my first idol, uh, she told me that I looked nothing whatsoever like Tom Cruise. <laughs> And then I just uh, wore a hat for the next month until my fringe grew. <laughs> well, by the time grade 12 came along, what, what haircut were you sporting at the start of 1993? Oh, I'd had enough of the short back and sides by 93, so I had this great idea that I would just l- let my hair grow and not get a haircut. So I was always trying to impress my dad, and maybe dad, he's a, he's a short back and sides man. So, um, But when I was 17, I thought, no, nah, it's time for a change. I'm going to grow it long. I sort of had Johnny Depp in mind. Uh, from a Tom couple of Cruise, different Johnny Depp, Paul Kennedy, they yeah. all they just roll off the tongue, don't they? Those, I wa- those three. I, wa- <laughs> I watched a lot of movies. <laughs> Big 80s movies fan. Your best mate lived just around the corner from your place. Tell me about him. Adam Ray is my best mate. I met him at kindergarten and uh, he was the funniest kid I've ever met. Uh, just made me laugh all the way for, through primary school. And we spent a lot of time together. We had a really good close group of mates. And then Adam and I went to the same high school. We rode to school every day. We we just talked hmm. probably for thousands of hours. If, if people have got a, a, a quintessential best friend, um, they'll know what I'm talking about. Adam was really talented. He was he was pretty good sportsman. I was obsessed by football, but he was uh, he had other interests. He was just so popular and could talk to everyone and I just loved being around him. I mean, all the problems I had with communicating with girls, he had none of that and he was and he was a great singer. He used to sing all the time and wanted to be a wanted to be a, a pop star. So uh, we, he was always singing and I was always singing back up. Why did the police stop you and, and Adam on your first day of grade 12? Adam was wearing his helmet. Back in the day, by the way, the, the, the helmet thing was big because um, it had only just been brought in that you had to wear a helmet if you're riding your bike. I, I didn't like that idea and that you had to be told what to wear. You know, I thought it was my head, my, my risk. Uh, so I came up with a, a scheme where I, I wrote in my diary a fake name and a fake address so that if I ever got stopped by the cops, I could just um, fork that over as my as my identification, then, you know, I wouldn't have to pay the fine. So they were um, they were set up that day outside school and we arrived and the, the, um, the young policeman waved me over, but I was pretty cocky. You know, I knew my, my, my plan was foolproof. Adam said goodbye and he's, um, you know, he, he chuffed off with his helmet to the bike shed. So there I was with the, the policeman and, and he was very nice, which I, I remember. And that, that shocked me because I'd had a, an incident with police about a year before where I was I was crook from school and I was off. I had the flu actually, but I was uh, wanting to catch the bus to go and watch a game of football where my uh, my schoolmates were playing. So on the way to the bus stop, I got pulled over. I had my big coat, beanie, scarf, gloves, and the cops thought I looked like a, a burglar that had been in the area. So they threw me over the bonnet and, and you know tossed me in the back of the car and eventually realised their mistake. But, uh, you know, I sort of had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about the police from that one, that point. But this young cop who pulled me over for um, not having a helmet, he was lovely and we had a good chat and I gave him my fake address and my fake name, which was Billy Wyatt from a movie called Stealing Home starring Jodie Foster, which was my favourite movie at the time. Anyway, I went to class feeling pretty good about myself and then the, the loudspeaker crackled and, and um, it was Paul Kennedy, please come to the office. And I'd heard that a couple of times before, but... Um, I quickly realised why. I looked down at my little copy of the fine that I got and I'd signed my real name. So <laughs> that, one did, that one didn't work. <laughs> so I went to the office and, uh, you know, the, the cop just sort of smiled at me and I, I got my $15 <laughs> fine and, and away I went. And the, it, I don't know, the school didn't say anything really, but um, why well, would they? They probably had, had more things to worry about. <laughs> Your hand was in a plaster cast that day. Why was that? Yeah, I started Year 12 in a, in a cast because there was an incident just before Christmas. We were standing outside the Grand Hotel and I was 17, but I was I was already diving headlong into, into the world of drinking at the local pub. 
And Frankston's got a really well-known pub scene, I guess, with four hotels on each corner, all slightly different, but all, all very hard drinking. And at the end of those nights, when it's closing time and the, and the security staff hose down the steps and, and everything's closed for the night, all the guys who are still there, no women, all the guys are stuck out on the on the footpath. No taxis come near the place because it's too dangerous and, you know, the only trouble is going to arise for the taxi driver. So you're basically stuck. You've got no way to get home and and um, you stand around and wait for someone to get in a fight, basically. You know, and the, the drums started beating. I knew that there was going to be trouble. At first I thought there was going to be a minor scuffle. But a bunch of guys turned up that I didn't recognise. And I, we knew everyone in Frankston. But these guys were outsiders and there's only one reason you turn up after midnight to the pubs if you're an outsider and that's to, to get into a blue or, or cause some sort of, of, you know, violence. And that's what happened. So there was a fight. My brother was was there with a couple of his friends and they got in a, into the fight. And my brother got set upon and, and he was shaping up. And my brother Steve was always such a, always a, such a gentle, gently spoken kid and... But he'd grown into have the frame of our dad and he was a strong man by the time he was 19 and, um, you know, so he was he was up for it and they, they started punching on and I was so frightened and I would never, ever admit that to anyone. I was so frightened of getting into fights. I wasn't a fighter but I but I wanted to fit in. Absolutely, number, number one thing, I wanted to be accepted by my brother's mates as a tough kid. So... Um, when Steve got into his his part of the fight, I flew to try and defend him. And um, Sarah, it's it's a very strange thing for me that I don't remember the next, I, I don't know how long, but maybe 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. When I came to, I hadn't been knocked unconscious, but I was just, the only way I can describe it is I was out of my mind because I don't remember it, never have. Anyway, um, the, the guys... On the other side of the fight, started breaking bottles and uh, were, were uh, trying to stab people and, and uh, wanted to cause further harm. We were able to um, eventually just skip through the one local fish and chip shop that was open. Uh, luckily, a couple of our mates had gone to get a taxi and, and around the corner we jumped into a cab. I don't know how they found it and we took off. But, uh, yeah, Steve asked me how it was when we were in the cab and there, my knuckle had shifted so I'd hit something and um, I'd broken my hand. And I'm looking at it right now, Sarah, and that knuckle is still there. It's uh, right, pushed right up to the middle of my hand. So I was in a plaster cast for six weeks after that and, uh, you know, left to contemplate a lucky escape but um, uh, some damage there as well. What was your big dream as a 17-year-old Paul? My number one dream from the time that I could walk was to play AFL. And uh, that was VFL when I was when I was a kid. But I just wanted to play in the top legs, and I, I wanted to play for Collingwood. What are your earliest it. memories of of football? How far back can you remember football in your life? I can remember a couple of um, early games. I can remember my brother playing in the under nines, and I used to with you know dirty knees because I was chasing my own ball around. I, I used to follow him from end to end. So wherever Steve was, I would go, and if, if he's one end, I'd walk up there. And I couldn't wait to have my shot. I must have been seven at the time, so I can remember that clearly. Mum and Dad have got some old photos of of me playing with a plastic brown football when I was barely six months old. So oh I, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> how they knew that I wanted to be a footballer, but I got the ball early in Pakapanyo. How did the footy feel in your hands? The ball itself. What was that like? I. I it it feels feels beautiful. That's that's uh, that's as you know. It it's it's that good. I I grew up and I just could not ever walk past a ball or a bat. You know, in, in summer it was cricket, but um, if there was a football lying around, I couldn't walk past it. I just had to pick it up and toss it around and kick it to myself. And um, so so it's very natural thing. Right from the start, yeah, it's uh, it's it's difficult to explain. It's a, almost a spiritual thing because I I love footy so much, and and everything built on that. You know, when I was old enough to realise that the 
Collingwood players had numbers on their backs. You know, I memorised all those numbers and I wanted to be those guys. And my brother and I would lie in our bunks at night and, and go through the numbers. One, Ricky Barham, two, and, and on we'd go. And Who was your favourite player? Peter Dacos was my number one favourite. What number um, was he? And number 35. I, I started to realise that Peter Dacos was around. He, he had some knee injuries in about 84, I think it was, but I was seven or eight. And I remember talking to, to Steve about my favourite players and he said, you know, there's another guy. He's been injured this year, but he's he's great. That's Peter Dacos. And, and then I saw him play next year and I was hooked. He's, for those who don't know, Peter Dacos ha, had sort of a long body and short legs. He was a virtual magician with the ball. He could twist it and turn it any way. He kicked torpedoes from 60 metres out. He marked one-handed. He had such a, uh, a great great balance because of his makeup of his body and um, and his skills were superb. And Not I to mention the mullet. And, oh, he had, a, he had an, a fantastic mullet which seemed to sort of, you know, carry much of his power, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> he was a superb player and, um, and I wanted to be like Dakes. So to practice, I, I heard him, he was the first person I heard say practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So I carried that um, from my idol and I used to go outside and, and kick on the road. Steve and I would have kick to kick on the road. Um, then when Steve got old enough to get an apprenticeship and, and become busy, then I would kick at a lamppost. Our new estate didn't have power lines, so we just had these lampposts every 100 or 200 metres and I had one right out the front of my place and I just used to go 20, 30, 40 metres away and just time and again just try and hit the lamppost for accuracy and that was how I practised my skill. Your dad was your coach in the Seaford under 11s. What conversation did you overhear him and your mum having mm. late one night? Uh, this is very typical of dad. Uh, he was I was in my bunk and it, it must have been early in the season. That's when they picked kids for interleague. Every team in those days would pick one child from their club and then send them to play in a representative team, which we called interleague. At that stage, I couldn't play for Collingwood. I was only 10 so, or 10 or 11, so uh, I, I wanted to play interleague. Anyway, I heard this conversation with mum and dad in the kitchen. They never really argued in front of us. I think, I think they had a rule that um, they would settle their disputes uh, behind closed doors, but I overheard them. It wasn't quite an argument, but they, it was a difference of opinion. Dad was saying, I can't pick him in the team. I'm going to pick someone else. He was clearly talking about me. And mum, this is very typical of her, she said, well, Paul's the best player. You've got to pick him. And dad said, I agree with you. He is the best player, but I'm not going to do it. And stood firm. Usually mum could talk dad into m most things, but um, not this one. And then the door swung open on my, on my bedroom and dad came in. And he just sort of sat next to me and put his, put his hand on my head and, you know, ruffled my hair and Realised I was awake and said, um, you know, I'm going to pick Andre for the interleague. And he said, I, I just feel like Andre deserves this opportunity. Um, he's going to probably not play as many, you know, representative games as you will. I want to give him a chance and you'll get your chance to, to stand out and show people how special you are later on. And so anyway, I was shattered by that and, and, and cried. And I thought Dad was trying to sort of remove himself from any accusations of nepotism and, and maybe some criticism from other parents that, oh, you're just picking your kid. But I, I look back now and I've known for quite some time that Dad was just a generous, generous man. He's He really wanted Andre to have a go and he knew that I would get my shot and um, I was absolutely honest. And Dad, because Dad, um, Andre came from a from a pretty solid family, but, but Dad was always looking out for kids. And years later, they some of the kids who Dad used to fondly call battlers um, used to stop him in the street and, and thank him. Oh, thanks, Mr. Kennedy. You know, they never played much after the under-12s, but he gave them a great experience. He was he was the best coach. He was just so fair to everyone and they loved that. Kids kids know when you're being fair. Was your mum as big a, a footy fan as your dad? Yeah, she loved footy. She loved Collingwood. My uncle Bob played under-19s for Collingwood back in the day. My, my other uncle was mad Collingwood. So that's where the Collingwood... Um, you know, uh, barracking came from. She was also an Elvis fan. What story? <laughs> what story did she tell you about her and Elvis? Oh, uh, actually, you know, if I if I'm 
sort of praising my parents for being honest all the time. I've got to pick them up on this one. <laughs> Mum told us that she used to date Elvis and she, we had this big mirror. It was, uh, you know, it was not, a, not a clear mirror. It had a big picture of Elvis on it. So this big Elvis head was ever present in our house because a big mirror with Elvis's head. Anyway, she told us with a straight face that she used to go out with Elvis Presley. And I believed her because why wouldn't I? And uh, I believed that right up until the time I was maybe eight or nine and a teacher, I told the teacher about this and the teacher picked me up on it and said, that's not true. I said, how would you know? I said, no, it's true. Mum told me. Anyway, she, she sort of argued against it, said it mustn't be true, and I went home and um, I asked Mum about it. I said, this teacher doesn't believe you, Mum. And she said, oh, yeah, I've got to own up. Um, <laughs> she, she only ever dated Elvis in her dreams. And I was relieved, Sarah, because, um, you know, I thought that Dad might have been her second choice. But, um, yeah, I was <laughs> safe in the knowledge that, that Dad was probably her first choice. All that kicking at the lamppost paid off. You made the Southern Stingrays a, a representative team that was a feeder into the AFL. Tell me yep. about the Stingrays. What was the uniform? Oh, the Stingrays, we had a we had an awful... <laughs> I loved it at the time, but uh, we've, we had an awful um, big brown Stingray on our chest and our jumpers were yellow and white and, and back in the day they were a different... Um, material, and we used to have uh, collars. So anyway, it was, that that was great. I loved being a stingray. I, I felt so lucky to be selected. In no way was I a standout junior. I was a good junior, and for my club, I was a good player. But through my sort of 16, 17, I, I started to thicken up and and sort of get more of my dad's physique. And um, yeah, I was selected in the in the Southern Stingrays. And yeah, they, they used to do stories in the Herald Sun. I'd never had my name in the paper before, except for the local one. And, um, you know, uh, recruiters would turn up to watch, ex-AFL players would coach. Our coach was Greg Hutchison, ex, an ex-Melbourne player. Oh, it was just, it was a joy to play in that competition in those days. Everything was new and the, the grounds were great. We got to play at VFL Park and, and Moorabbin and all these great places. What was your ritual, Paul, driving to the match? Mum and Dad would drive me to the games. Uh, they never missed a match. And we had a Toyota High Ace. So um, I would sit in the back of the van, put on my headphones and plug them into my Walkman. And I used to listen to um, Mark Conn's uh, walking in Memphis, over and over again, it was my pump-up song. Curious everyone choice as a pump-up song, <laughs> I have to I know, say. Everyone, everyone has their pump-up songs. It's and not so, I Have I the Tiger, it, though, walking no, in Memphis. No, it's not ACDC, is it? So <laughs> and Mark Kahn, if people remember that song, go, they should go and play it because it's a great song. <laughs> what got me going was the piano, you know, when the piano started uh, kicking in and I just loved it. So I would... Um, play that over and over and I would visualise playing. And when you play football, I mean, there's there's the time on the field, but there's other special moments. It is driving to the game and, and thinking about how you're going to go and it's arriving at the ground and meeting your teammates and getting ready in the change rooms. That All that stuff is is almost as good as, as playing. Podcast. Broadcast. This is Conversations with Sarah Kanoski. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. Or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. So, Paul, what were your nerves like in the change room before those those games with the Stingrays? What do you remember? <laughs> yeah, when I look back and think about that, I just get I get the best feeling. I was so nervous all the time. At the start of that year, I still had my, my plaster cast was off, but a doctor recommended that I just sort of wear some padding. So I always made sure I had my left hand in a little with a little bit of padding. I got my jumper on to to make me make me feel special. And uh, then I just sort of walked around and had a bit of a handball with the other guys and everyone 
were sort of clenching their jaws and, and this is where the day starts to get serious and, um, you know, people deal with their nerves in, in their own way. I always had to go to the toilet before every game of football I ever played and that told me that that my stomach was churning so much and I wasn't sick and I wasn't feeling poorly. My stomach was churning so hard for the game, that the, the, the thing mm. that I'd waited all week for. You know, that was a physical reaction. So it's not just an emotional preparation. This was a, something physical happening with me that I was so excited. I've never been in a in a footy change room, Paul, but from what I see on TV, they, they're kind of intimate places, you know? Blokes are walking around half-dressed, there's a lot of touching, there's there's a real intimacy in that space. There is, and, and I think it's a it's it's a great place to be. And and if you're in a special team, some teams might be different. It, it, all teams are slightly different, but uh, with the Stingrays at that time, I, I felt a lot of love in the room and it was a great, great place to be. And, you know, you, a little tap here, you know, a tap on the shoulder or even a tap on the bum, um, we were we were intimate, you know, it was an intimate place. And then we, when the, someone would speak, you know, if Hutchie would speak, we'd all gather in really close and it felt good to be close and felt good to sort of be connected to, to your teammates in that way. I just, I, f- I felt like that was, you know, the only place in the world that I ever wanted to be was with my team and getting ready to play and, and hanging off the coach's word. And, um, yeah, I, I would describe that as a really lovely place to be for a 17-year-old boy in, in, in a team that had a really nice culture. AFL can be a, a rough game. How did you handle the knocks on the field? I... I prided myself on being aggressive. And at that early point in the year, all I wanted to do was please the coach. I remember in a practice match, I laid a really heavy tackle and it was near the coach and, and I just happened to look over and he nudged someone, you know, in, in, a, in a sort of sign of approval. And so that's the type of player I wanted to be. I could read the game and I could read the movements of the game. I was always looking to, to get as many kicks as I could. I played across half back, it's a centre half back or half back, which is a place where you can cut the ball off and you can take marks and, and set a bit of play up here and there. But primarily I just wanted to be a good teammate and I wanted to be known as as an aggressive teammate, which gets a little bit back to um, what I was saying before about that, that violence. Football can be a violent game, but controlled violence usually. And I had a lot of control, so I was I was never never frightened of any collisions on the field. And I felt I had where I lacked courage and I lacked certainty in other parts of my life, you know, in a big way. I don't feel I at that point I never lacked courage on the on the field. And you know, so if a ball was going over my head, the great sign of a courageous player, so called courageous player in football, is to go back, run back, tilt your head up, watch the ball float over your head. Don't look what's coming the other way. Keep going back and, and we call that running back with the flight of the ball. And every time the ball was in the air and, and that happened, I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to show people I was courageous. So for me, the violence, the controlled violence of the game, the brutality of the game was something that I really enjoyed. That's how I wanted to fit in and be seen. You got the chance to play a, a few matches with St Kilda that year. Did the big stage live up to all those childhood dreams of, of what it would be like? Uh, it, it did and it didn't. Um, I think the stage lived up to itself. I didn't live up to um, what, I, what I thought I could achieve. I went and played. At that, at that time, the AFL teams were using the under-18 competition to get players out and make up the numbers in the reserves. But it was, I think it was more than that. They were sort of trialling um, youngsters at that higher level. So I got the call up one night to go and play for St Kilda and I played out at Waverley against Melbourne and uh, let's be honest but my performance was 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 uh, not even competent I sat on the bench for most of it I did note before the game that that I didn't have to go to the toilet and I and I was frightened about that because my stomach wasn't churning I didn't have the same electricity about it and that was my insecurities I, I was so caught up with oh no I, f- I feel out of place that I that I wasn't in the right mind to um to perform well at all, but I sat a, sat for a while on the on the bench with the um, the old dressing gown as you did in those days, and then in the second half got my chance to to go on and show what I could do. And there's one moment I, I played on 
uh, Greg Healy. I remember that distinctly because Greg Healy used to be captain of Melbourne, and, but he was in the twos and I guess his career was sort of winding down. But I uh, played on him and that was a big thrill. And then I did get my chance to, to do something late in the game. The ball was kicked to me. I was out on the outer wing. If you don't know Waverley Park, it's the biggest ground ever. It's it, it it's way bigger than the MCG. So you feel like you're in this big paddock. And I'd made some space. I, mean, I was all alone. The ball came to me and I thought, here's my chance. You know, I'll grab this. And uh, the ball hung in the air too long. I, I had too much time to think about it and I dropped it. And I could never remember dropping a chess mark in my life, but I dropped it. And I heard the crowd groan. Enough people there to watch and be disgusted in my performance and just give that, uh, there was some laughing as well. So that was my contribution that day. And uh, I, unfortunately, I remember remember it very, very clearly. The next week I played at Prince's Park. I played marginally better, but I was lethargic and it, mm-hmm. it took a rocket from from my teammate, a fellow Seaford boy called Ann Harvey, to, um, to get me to fire up a little bit and finally you know, have a crack and try to get my hands on the ball and try and do something rather than act like a spectator, which was what I was doing. You were doing a lot of drinking at that stage of your life. Was that impacting yeah. your performance on, on the field or at 17? Yeah. Are you able to do both? No, it, it did impact my performance. Um, I was still going out and, and drinking really heavily with my mates either at the Seaford Footy Club or in the Frankston pubs. Uh, it, it, one of the, one of the worst things I did was got really drunk before a match with the Stingrays where we had to drive a bus the next day and and catch a bus to Seymour where I was born to play against the Murray Bush Rangers. And late that night, I was really drunk. I was even smoking cigarettes, which I never usually did, but I just didn't care. And I was a little bit out of control. And, um, that, that same guy, Ant Harvey from played at St Kilda at the time but was a Seaford boy. He was there. He'd played the day before. And he said to me, what are you doing? Go home. Really forcefully, go home. Take take your footy more seriously. And I remember that. It was, a, it was like a slap in the face. But at that time, I wasn't listening to, to too much advice about my drinking. I just thought I could do it all. You know, I could drink and party and play good footy at the same time. So the next day, we went to play in Seymour and I actually played a, quite a good game. I was I was among the best players on the ground. And that was maybe the worst thing that happened to me because after that I thought I could do both and I could do it all and, hey, look at me, I can, I can drink and still play really good football. But um, that's, a, that's a lie that I told myself. And as the year went on, by the time I was playing in those reserves games for St Kilda, my fitness had dropped a little bit. And it, at that level, if you're not absolutely as fit as you can be and as ready as you can be, then that's a big drop. You know, if I drop 10% of my fitness, that's that takes away whatever I can bring. You use a particularly Australian term to describe what was happening with you and drinking. Pisshead, is that what you mean? <laughs> that's what I am. That's what I'm referring <laughs> to. What kind of pisshead yeah. were, you? were you? I mean, what did drinking do to your personality? Drinking allowed me to feel confident around girls it allowed me to forget about all the insecurities I had. I can I can see now, and I I sort of felt at the time even that drinking on the night before a game, being a party boy and all that. If I if I failed to make the AFL, then I had an excuse. Oh, you know, but you know, I was I was you know going out with the boys. You know, that's why I didn't make it. So it, it connects to that very basic and very common fear of failure. But the biggest problem for me in that was I I could never drink in moderation. As soon as I started drinking and and got the taste for it, I went hell for leather. And so my binge drinking was was fast and furious. Built into that is that I started to get a reputation among my my friends and my brother's friends for being a hard drinker and, and they seemed to enjoy it and I liked living up to that. So in a way, I sort of, after a while, I felt, felt a little bit trapped. I felt, you know, I was, I was acting out a role, but it was a problem that I, that I couldn't curtail because every time I went to a party, I just, I, I got out of control. And that's not to say that it was, I was, I felt like I was punishing myself in any way. I actually really liked 
the feeling of, of getting drunk for for a period of time, you know, that sweet spot where you, you feel a bit tipsy and everything's good and you're having a laugh. and But that, that sweet spot was very, very short for me because, um, you know, then I would start, you know, sculling and, and um, getting into drinking games and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, I, I was a... I was a weekend pisshead. The the quiet, really suburban world of of footy and and parties that you lived in. How did that all change in June nineteen ninety three? In in June nineteen ninety three, there was a big thunderstorm, and in that thunderstorm, when the rain was falling, unknown to anyone, of course, how how could you know? A killer went out to to murder a woman. A young woman who was um, catching a bus from Frankston TAFE down to uh, Lang Warren, where she lived with her auntie and uncle. She stepped off the bus. The killer grabbed her, took her to the Lloyd Park Reserve, which was one of the local footy grounds where we used to play our junior footy. He murdered her there, and then her body was found the next day. No trace of the killer, but of course the homicide squad came in and there was a big investigation. There was a mannequin dressed up like Elizabeth Stevens so that, you know, people could maybe provide clues. There weren't any clues, really. The the, the crime scene had been um, damaged by the rain and it was an investigation that went unsolved and then there was another crime and another one after that. Two more women got murdered, first one in Seaford uh, and the second one just over from Seaford in Frankston North. What do you remember talking about at home or with your friends? With Within the space of a few months, three women in your community have been murdered. It must have been terrifying. It, it, was, it was frightening when Elizabeth Stevens was murdered and, and everyone talked about how unsafe it was for women to go out. And some of the editorials, Sarah, written, written in the local papers at the time could have been written now. It's... It, there was great debate over whether or not it was safe for women to go out. And then when the second murder happened, Debbie Freem was a mother. She had a 12-day-old son and she nipped down to the milk bar and when she came out of the milk bar and got in her car, the killer was in the back seat. He abducted her and killed her and, and dumped her body in nearby Caram Downs. At that point, we knew as a community that there was a serial killer. We, we knew that there was too much, uh, too many similarities for them to not be connected. The police tried to do what they, they do and tried to say, we haven't made any connections between the two. But of course, the night before the second murder, another woman was, there was an attempted abduction as well. So everyone knew at that point we had a serial killer. Eventually the police sort of admitted it and said that, uh, you know, this is what we're looking at. There were big town hall meetings in Seaford where people gathered, there was a lot of frustration, obviously fear, some anger, people calling for capital punishment. And then from then, the the community changed completely. The streets were empty. People were staying in their houses. Women were encouraged not to be anywhere by themselves. So if they were working in a, a workplace, someone would escort them to their cars Security guards were hired all over the place. Some streets um, hired security guards with Alsatians to walk up and down their streets. Police were door knocking and the helicopters were always overhead. The noise of heli- helicopters over our neighbourhood is something that's uh, that's a long-lasting memory as well. So it was, it was a terrible, frightening time and, and no one who lived through that will ever forget it. People, people have spoken to me and I agree. It feels like last week. It just feels, doesn't feel, you know, 30 years ago. How did police finally catch the murderer? When the the third girl was killed, Natalie Russell was 17 and she was, she was in year 12 at John Paul College, which is the local Catholic school. She was murdered walking along a track from the school to her home in the afternoon. So the, the killer was becoming bolder. Around that time, around the very very time that she was murdered, there was a car spotted on the street. It was unregistered and it attracted attention of a, a postie who called police and they took the details of the car. The next day, they followed up on the ownership of the car and that led them to the killer. But I turned up to play football for the Stingrays at Moorabbin and that was our home ground and, and walked out. Our, 
our ritual was to go and meet in the middle of the grounds with our bags over our shoulders and get ready for the day. And I'll never forget um, seeing the face of Jeff White, who was a young kid on our team, a young ruckman who always smiled. He was always laughing and smiling. Jeff White went on to play uh, 250 games of AFL, so people might know him. But he was 16 then and, uh, you know, I was I was shocked by the look on his face. He had tears running down his cheeks and I said, what's wrong? And he said, he's killed another one and we know her. So he went to John Paul College and, and uh, Jeff and a couple of others in the team knew Natalie Russell personally. So it was all very close mm. to home. And thankfully, within 24 hours, police had their confession and they had the killer and, and from then it felt like spring had, <laughs> had come early because uh, oh, it was just such a relief. When he confessed, did he say why he had, had murdered these women who were, were strangers yeah. to him? Yeah, this, the story is, is become uh, well known in our parts now. He's He was taken in, initially denied it, but uh, very quickly the police had him confess and they asked him why and he just said, I just hate him. And he meant women. I just hate him. I'm the, the same age as you, Paul, and grew up in Queensland, but not a million miles away from the kind of community that you were in. And one of my memories is how much aggression and, and ugliness there was around sex and relationships between boys and girls. You know, even the language that, that boys used around girls. Were you conscious of, of that at the time, at, at 17? I was, and I had, to, I had to explore this in writing the book, Sarah, because our, our conversations at school were very casual. You know, my friends and I would sit around and we would discuss, you know, who was the best looking girl. And then we'd take it further and, and discuss whether or not they were virgins. And we, we had no idea what we were talking about, by the way. I was, I was still a virgin myself. You know, my experiences with girls were, were so limited. But, yeah, our, our language was, was very poor. You know, in the local football club, it was probably an, at another level. Girls were called moles and sluts. And this was all very casual. And so I had to think about, am I just looking back at that now and saying I, I can see now that we, we were being horrendously sexist? And the answer is no. I knew at the time because I never spoke that way in front of my mum or my sisters. You know, I would never tolerate anyone calling my sisters those names. So we knew that we were, you know, using language that was inappropriate. But that's what we did. And, you know, we were, I guess we learned from older boys and and that was where our language came from. But, uh, yeah, and I, I certainly wasn't, wasn't brave enough at that stage to to put an end to it and say that we don't want to use that language. In fact, I was I was as bad as anyone. Um, I actually wanted to fall in love. I, I You know, we just talked about um, getting notches on the belt and using harsher language than that about, you know, um, treating, treating girls as, as conquests. I actually just wanted to fall in love. So I was desperate to have a connection with a girl and, and, and you know, I was yearning for that. And, and this is not middle-aged wisdom. I was writing about it in a journal. I was writing who will love me <laughs> you know, and, 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 and opening my heart to these, to these um, you know, little notebook pages that I had. But yeah, I couldn't speak out. You know, I, would, I never dared tell anyone, hey, you know, I really want to fall in love this week, you know, when I go to the Frankston pubs. It just wasn't something that I was courageous enough to confess. You, uh, you had that little run-in with the police about your helmet on the first day of grade yeah. 12. Why did you cross paths with, with the police again <laughs> right at the end of your school year? Yeah, well, we were just about to finish high school. We went out and we had a really good night. Someone mentioned, let's go to the school and just hang out there until the sun comes up and muck-up day starts. Anyway, we went to the school. I was with two other friends we decided that it would be boring just to sit around, so why don't we get into the school hall and play basketball? We used to have a thing where you get the mini tramps out and do slam dunks. So that seemed like a reasonable idea. Of course, the hall was closed, so we had to break in, and I put a fire hydrant through one of the door windows, and my mate climbed through, and, and we got in there. It was pitch dark inside, and except for a little light in the corner that I saw flashing, and I knew straight away and I started to sober up fairly quickly. That was a silent alarm. So 
we walked outside, got out of there, and there was a security guard standing out the front of the school. And the security guard was, was a nice man. He said, uh, where have you blokes been? We said, oh, just sort of walking home. We had a big night out. Oh, yeah, you haven't seen anyone over here at the, uh, the gymnasium, have you? No, no, we haven't. No. Nah. Anyway, as we're having this casual conversation, three cop cars uh, roar up the road, screech, and I heard them before I saw them. And uh, within an instant, I was flipped under my stomach on the on the footpath and had the had the cuffs slapped on me and thrown in the back of the car, taken to the Chelsea cop shop, and um, and did a few hours in the cell. You were called in, not surprisingly, to the principal the next morning. What was on the TV while you were waiting for that uh, meeting with your destiny? <laughs> this, this is one of the things, Sarah, where I had to think back and did that really happen? Anyway, it was terrible at the time. I had to sit out in front of the um, principal's office. The draft was on TV. Can you believe it? The first time the draft was ever televised and I could watch it on TV and I thought, yeah, you know, hungover, probably still slightly drunk. I must have been a little bit drunk because I remember thinking, oh, maybe I'll get drafted. Of course, I didn't. And then uh, and that was it. The draft was over. Oh, well, I'm not going to get drafted. That's the end of my AFL dream. And then the principal brought me into, into his room and said, you're expelled. You will never, ever set foot on this schoolyard again. And that was it. Packed up my stuff and left. So no uh, professional AFL team, no great academic conclusion to your years of schooling. How did, how did you get the idea to try journalism? Our school was, was a rough and ready school, but it had this great shining light and that was the teachers. And we had a really strong English department. And I still, I still remember all of those teachers so well. A teacher called Mrs Mack. She was outstanding. She was a young teacher. She would take anything on. Towards the end of the year, she made a very um, logical suggestion that if you like reading and writing, why don't you think about journalism as something you might pursue? It was pretty obvious at this stage I was not going to university, but um, she suggested that there are cadetships, which I'd never heard of. I thought there were only apprenticeships for trades. But yeah, from that, the the seed was was sown and I thought, yeah, well... I would like to write stories for a living. So journalism was in the back of my mind at that stage. Hearing you describe this year in your life and, and reading the book, Paul, it's so clear that things could have gone really differently for you. You know, you could have kept up that crazy drinking. You could have not found your feet with work. Has revisiting this year for you made you think about that? Yeah, it, it was. I've thought about that a lot. And really the, the great question for me is why was I carrying on like that? Why was I making those choices when I came from such a, a peaceful home with mum and dad as great role models? Why did I make those choices? I've, I've come to the conclusion that boys like me are delivered twice, uh, once into their mother's arms and then again when they're about 15 or 16. So this period of 15 or 16 I was looking for other role models and then that's why I chose to to go down that path and, and, and be a macho guy and wear that tight mask of bravado and never take it off. And then that was despite the, the greatest role models in my life showing me another way, that's mum and dad. So I believe that the things that happened in year 12 set me on the path towards journalism and I missed out on AFL because I wasn't good enough, because, because I wasn't mature enough and journalism was was a better place for me anyway, and I've been able to do some good in journalism. So so I, I'm thankful that it all panned out the way it did. But um, yeah, it it could have, and, and my restlessness lasted longer. I didn't just wake up one day and then all of a sudden become comfortable around women. You know, it took a long time, I guess. But I, I suspect that because I was lucky enough, you know, some people aren't lucky in this way, but I was lucky enough to have that family grounding those values and I had the love of good friends and all the rest of it. I suspect I would have found my way eventually, but you're right, it, it could have gone it could have gone much worse for me if I had have continued down that self-destructive path. But, you know, I didn't. I was lucky. I was lucky at every turn, you know, even, even getting expelled, you know, I was lucky. Although they did say I wouldn't set back in that place again. I did go back because when my eldest son, Jack, 
needed to go from primary school to high school a couple of years ago, I went back to my school and I had to do a parents' tour of the place. <laughs> and so I did go back and I'm back there now. My two son, my two <laughs> eldest sons are in high school there and some of the teachers are the same, Sarah. Just behave yourself there this time, Mr Kennedy. It's been really great to speak with you. Thanks, Sarah. I've loved it. Paul Kennedy was my guest on Conversations today and Paul's memoir is Funky Town. I'm Sarah Kanoski. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Sarah Kanoski. For more Conversations interviews, head to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.